Well, we do begin a new series this morning. We're calling it Change Your World. It's based upon the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to be living in this book all summer long about how God can use you, some of the passion that you have, some of the, the burden that you may have for particular items to change the world around you, change your world, uh, to, to kind of supplement this uh, we know that you can get, summertime is a crazy time. It's already been a crazy time uh, for us. I know here at the church, staff meeting-wise, somebody is gone, or two or three are gone every week between camps and all these sorts of things. So things can get pretty disjointed. So what we'd like for you to do is, uh, we through this whole summer, next eight weeks anyway, we've put together a devotional thing called Change Your World. Okay, this is available in the bookstore if you want it in the printed uh, uh copy of it. Each week there is a biography of a person who changed their world that you can look at and gives you more places that you can go to learn more about that person. And then there's three devotions a week where you'll be reading different passages from the book of Nehemiah and Proverbs as we try to gain some insight and wisdom in our life of how we can change the world around you. If you are more high tech than a pencil and paper, all right? This is for you guys who are on iTech. How many of you have our church app? Can I see your hands? Oh, good, good, most of it. If you don't have it, go, go to, uh, uh, if you've got Apple, if you've got an iPhone, go to the Apple Store. You can download it there, or you can go uh, whatever the other deals are. Uh, what is it? Google and, and uh, Chrome. I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm obviously not a tech guy. But if you have the app on it, you, can, you punch the button for our app, you go to that, and uh, on the front page of it, it says Summer 2018 Devotional. You push the button on it, and it has the devotions all for this week, the, the biography and each of the days of the devotion that you can go with it. And you can write your answers on this. It has a place for you to take notes and things of that nature if you're high tech. If you're of the lower tech quality, we have the wonderful printed version for you available at the bookstore, all right? So take advantage of those things, and I think your summer will be enhanced as a result of it. Uh, let me just kind of take a poll. For those of you who are the best of the best, all right, you guys are the best of the best. You are the brightest of the bright. You are voted, you know, like most likely to succeed in your senior class or uh, maybe your freshman class or maybe kindergarten, that was when you wanted or something of that nature, or maybe in college or something, or maybe you were the head cheerleader or the star athlete or th something of that nature. I want you to know that despite all that, despite the fact that you may have been the brightest of the bright and the best of the best, God can still use you. Ah, you know that? He can still use you, all right? Now, I, I promise you, he can. But what I've found reading through Scripture, you read through the Old Testament, you read through the New Testament, there's one thing that becomes abundantly clear as just as a skimming, looking over the, the uh, 10,000 foot view of Scripture is it's kind of amazing that God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary changes in our world. Over and over again, the story of the Bible is about ordinary people who submit themselves to God. God gives them the strength and the knowledge and the wisdom and the capabilities to pull off some extraordinary changes within our world. I think that all of us see changes in our world that we think uh, needs to um, come about within our world. So this summer, we're looking at a guy as kind of our coach. His name is Nehemiah. Nehemiah has his own book in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, uh, Nehemiah was probably one of the last books of the Old Testament written. Uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Malachi were probably the last four books. They were contemporaries of each other that wrote. And then for 400 years, not a single scripture was written. 400 years. And so it's interesting for us to be able to look at the last things that God said before this, what some people call the period of silence before we have uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being written. And so this is 400 years of silence. So what Nehemiah says is very important. And he talks about some interesting things of where things that just broke his heart that he felt like needed to be changed. Nehemiah was an ordinary guy. He was not some uh, best of the best, although he did have kind of a unique job in one way or another. Uh, he was a cupbearer. Anybody know what a cupbearer is? Some of you think that you may be cupbearers. I was a cupbearer this week for my three-year-old grandson. He kept saying to me, Papa, I want some milk or juice or water, and he'd point to the cup. And I said, well, Micaiah, you can reach it. Papa. 
So I was a cup bearer this week, all right? So I would go and get his cup, and I would bring it to the king and bow before him and give him his cup. So that's what a cup bearer did. It's kind of a glorified butler in some ways, all right? But a cup bearer, what, what Nehemiah did was a little bit different in that he was kind of also known as the wine taster for the king because that's primarily what they drank. Water was not the best of things for people to drink. And so whenever the king would say, hey, I'm thirsty, uh, give me some wine, they would pour a glass, and, and uh, Nehemiah would take the glass, and he would drink of it first, and the king would watch him. And if Nehemiah didn't go, Bleh, then he knew he could drink of the cup, all right? So it's a pretty, you know, I know some of you are going, dude, man, I'd like to be the wine taster for the king. That sounds like a pretty cool deal. Well, it's cool only until you died, all right? Because there are people that are always trying to get rid of the king, but that was what Nehemiah's job was, kind of a glorified butler for King Artaxerxes, who was kind of a crazy guy in, in the sense, um, if you read anything about him historically speaking. And so the other weird thing about Nehemiah was this, is that you would think one of the more trusted people in your staff as a king would be someone of your own ethnicity, especially since ethnicity was such a big thing during that time period. Uh, Artaxerxes was Persian, uh, Nehemiah lived in Iran, and so whenever he chose, though, this most trusted person that would test the food and things for him and stand beside him day after day after day, he chose a Jewish guy. Nehemiah was Jewish, so evidently Nehemiah became known as having a stellar reputation and being someone who was very loyal and had a good track record. Now, what we want to look at is some events that began at the very first of Nehemiah, and as we walk through the summer, we're going to see Nehemiah pull off an incredible project because of something that he felt deeply within that God wanted him to do. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, all right? Just kind of give you some things about Nehemiah. Uh, It says, the words of Nehemiah. Now, all right, bad joke alert, okay? You know that Nehemiah was one of the shortest people in the Old Testament, right? Because he was knee high. And some of you are going to say, oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. You could laugh louder if you wanted to, and I wouldn't hurt my feelings. Okay, bad, I told you, bad joke alert, all right? The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, he had a bad cough. No, I'm sorry. Son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, the 20th year, while I was still in the citadel of Susa. Now, the first thing that catches my mind, and there's several historical issues we want to talk about here this morning, but the first thing is, one of the things is, what in the chili is Kislev? You know, the month of Kislev. I, I check my iPhone, and I've got January, February, March, April, May, but I don't have Kislev in there, all right? Kislev is a Jewish month, the way they counted their years. It corresponds to our late Novemberish, early Decemberish, okay, type of frame of, uh, of reference there, that time of the year. And so it was during this time of the year that Hakaliah, who is Nehemiah's brother, came to talk to him about some things. And he had just been on a trip. Let's go back to the, the passage, verse 2, if you will. It says, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. All right, short history lesson, okay? Um, the Jewish people went through periods, all right? If you, if you read from the time the Jewish nation was established, they went through periods where they were very strong in their faith, with, as far as their faith in God and following him and being very obedient to him. And uh, then they also went through times where it was just like God didn't exist at all. And God over and over and over and over again said, hey guys, if you obey me, there will be blessings, all right? If you follow me, you will be blessed. If you follow me, you'll be blessed. If you follow me, you'll be All right, you're getting the idea of it. Over and over again, he tells them. If you read through Deuteronomy, I mean, which is the second reading of the law, Moses emphasizes that over and over and over again. Follow me, blessings that come as the consequences of living this kind of lifestyle, all right? He also said, if you disobey me, if you don't follow me, you decide, you know, there's going to be consequences. If you disobey, there's going to be consequences. You're going to reap what you sow, all right? Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also 
Reap, some of you get that, okay? So it's, it's true in our lives, all right? And God kept warning them over and over again. But, but Israel kept going through this cycle over and over again. And finally, it got to the point, God said, you know, you're going to lose your right to the land, okay? One, the kingdom split into two different ones, northern and southern kingdom. The southern, of course, was the more spiritual because they said y'all more often. Boy, you guys are really cynical here on Father's Day, okay? All right, so the northern kingdom was utterly destroyed. I mean, there's not any remnants left of the, of the ten tribes there. The two uh, tribes that were left in the southern kingdom lasted a little longer. Finally, Babylon came in. They destroyed the temple. They, depart, they deported vast amounts of the Jewish population back to Babylon, and so they were put into service there in lots of different areas. You remember Dan, a guy by the name of Daniel? Okay, Daniel was one of those guys that became official in the court for years and years and years, very, a guy of very high integrity. And Nehemiah is one of the kind of the second generation of these people who came into after the Babylonians were conquered by the Medes and the Persians, all right? So Israel got into great trouble, it says, uh, they said to me, those who survived the exile or back in the province are in great what? Trouble. And what's that next word? Disgrace. Now, we can read past those words, and they just go whoop, right over our heads. But I want you to get the feeling of them. The reason they're in trouble and disgrace is because, number one, there was, there were some that were left there, and they still hadn't learned their lesson. They were still trying to figure out how they could manipulate God. Anybody ever tried to manipulate God? Had that work for you? Not so good, did it, okay? And so they're, they're still thinking they can do that. They're still having problems while they're in, in Israel. This remnant comes back, and when they get there, they try to build, rebuild the temple. That's what Ezra, the book of Ezra is about. But they, they stop rebuilding the temple. They get so far along, and it's just so discouraging because there's so many attacks and things on them. And the walls of Jerusalem have been broken down. It says its gates have been burned with what? All right, we, we live in a society that we don't get it. So what? Your walls are down. So what? Your gates are burned with fire. I mean, what difference does it make? We've got interstates going through our town several different directions here in Muskogee. But in those days, in those days, a city with no gates, a city with no walls, was an invitation for, for, for marauding armies and just bands of of nomads who would go through that area of the country to go in and plunder and attack the town. Enemy troops could ride through the city day or night. They could steal anything they want. And the people who lived in a city with no gates lived in constant fear. They were just, they were just vulnerable. And it, just, it was just a horribly depressing, uh, disgusting situation for the Jews who were living there. And there's been a remnant that had come back from exile to specifically build the temple. They were not able to do it because the walls of protection were down. Everybody, it would be like you would ha live in a neighborhood that there was just all kinds of robberies going on all the time and you had no way to protect your house. Nothing at all. There's no way to protect their city. So people were down, you know. And so what Nehemiah did next stunned everybody that was in this Small circle of conversation going on. Verse 4, it says, When I heard these things, I sat down and what? Wept. Now, he didn't just cry there. For some days. Did you get that? Days. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I mean, the news hit Nehemiah. When Nehemiah heard about Jerusalem being decimated and defeated. It's like a knife just going into his chest. It was a heartbreaker for him. It brought him to his knees, and he was, he was incapacitated to, for several days where he just cried and cried and cried. He barely knew what to do with himself. All right, time out for just a second. Okay. What travesty. What, what, what disgrace. What defeated thing. What brokenness do you see in your world that has a similar effect on your heart like it did on Nehemiah's? Have you ever been driving through a neighborhood and you just see certain things and you just go, man, it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. Or maybe at your, where you work, you see some things that are going on at work and you go, 
that, that's just not right. It shouldn't be that way. Maybe you see some things uh, where you live within our community here in Muskogee or in other areas. What, what is it that breaks your heart? What are those unique things that just kind of like a knife goes <clears throat> into your heart and wrecks your heart? What is that? Nehemiah heard those things and he wept for days. He couldn't get over it. It just, <sighs> God, what am I going to do? And he prays and he fasts and he prays and he fasts for days. It, it wrecked him. What breaks your heart? Is there anything that breaks your heart? I, I, I'm going to say something that's going to date me quite a bit, but I do that quite often anymore, okay? And that is that Nehemiah had what, I, what might be called a Popeye moment. You know what I'm saying? How many of you know about Popeye? Ever saw the cartoons Popeye? Popeye the... <laughs> Good deal. All right. Now, Popeye the... What was the other thing he did with his pipe? Doot, doot. You remember that? Popeye the sailor man. All right, good job. Okay, now, so here's Popeye, the sailor man. He, uh, he's, he just, uh, he was kind of a small guy. He, I mean, just an ordinary guy, except he had anatomically weird arms. You remember that? I mean, arms as big as most people's thighs and stuff. And he, he walked around like this, and he also had a, a girlfriend named Olive Oil. Olive Oil. <laughs> what can we say about Olive Oil? I mean, she was, uh, she had... She was like a stick, all right? Uh, but for some reason, uh, boy, Popeye, I'm not saying it's just based on physical food, but Popeye dearly loved her and people around him. I mean, when, Pop, when olive oil would walk down the street, uh, men would whistle and dogs would bark. I don't know what the deal was with that thing. But, uh, but she was uh, his, his goyal friend, okay? And so whenever olive oil was mistreated or something of that nature, uh, he would be patient for a moment. He didn't seem like he wanted to interrupt or overreact. But as it got, became increasingly troublesome to him, especially when a guy named Brutus kept trying to steal olive oil from him, he would flex his arms, you know, into the watching world, and he'd toot on his pipe, and he says, he'd say, that's all I can stand and I can stands no more, right? Okay, that's all I can stand and I can stands no more. And then he would grab a can of what? spinach and he'd crush that can the spinach would go up in the air and he'd gulp it down nom, 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 and then his arms would get even bigger and he would just jump into the fray and so that was his his uh, uh, big moment that was his moment I guess you could say it, holy discontent that's what Nehemiah is going to do he's going to look at the broken down walls of Jerusalem and the disgrace that his people in and he can see olive oil in the midst of it and he says I can that I, that's all I can stand I can stand no more doot, doot. You know, And so that's what's happening in the heart of Nehemiah. He hears that God's city, God's city for the Jews, is being decimated, disgraced. It's lying in ruin. And the more he thinks about it, the mounting pressure and frustration just digs into his spirit. And he says, I can stand no more. And he does something about it. Now, what breaks your heart? What travity, what injustice, what disgrace to God do you see going on in your neighborhood, in your work site, in your world that's like a knife that plunges into your chest? And when you see it, the angrier you get and you say, that's not right. It's not right. I've got to do something about it. That's all I can stand. I can stand no more. Nehemiah tells us the next step in his progression at the end of verse 4 when he says, once again, for some days, some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, Nehemiah begins to pray a very clear-minded, take-no-prisoners kind of prayer in which he includes the following phrases. In verse 6, he says, I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. Now, let me remind you that the Israelites have been in Persia and Babylon for a long time by this time. And what the Israelites did back that caused them to be deported and the gates to be burned and things of that nature 
was not really on um, Nehemiah himself at all. It happened before he was ever born. But he identified with the people group. And this is going to get into little sticky subjects here. Guys, there's, there's sometimes that we need to be aware that generations before us committed sin that still has its results in the people around us. You realize that? And we can say all we want, I didn't do that. Nehemiah didn't blaspheme God, but it was still on him. And he realized the consequences were still there. And so he prays to God and he says, God, it's not on you, it's on us. We, we messed up. We've sinned before you. And it's, it's our fault. God, this isn't your fault. It's my, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, and it's also me. I have that same thing within my heart. It's in me also. So Nehemiah says he's sorry on behalf of all the Israelites. God, I'm sorry. This is not on you. This is, this is us. And friend, this, this is big because he says, basically, I'm available. If you need to change this, I've got the burden. I'm available. I, 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 if you want me to walk away from it, that's fine. But I'm available to go and fix whatever's there. Now, here's something I, I want to add to this because it's not just what breaks your heart. I, I read something last night that I, I had not thought about. Be honest, read this old, old writer, older than me writer, okay? Like he's already dead type writer. And uh, you, you just think I look dead. I'm not, okay? So he says, a guy by the name of Alan Redpath, he says, while we may feel burdens for different things, and we may have a burden for something, it may not be the burden that God wants us to have. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are, you can look around, you can see lots of injustices. You can't solve all those injustices. And you may have a burden for some of those things, but when you connect that burden that exists with what God's call on your life is, and maybe how God has prepared you up to this point, then it becomes a burden that you and God together can team up and change your world. Do you understand what I'm saying? It becomes a passion that is also part of God's passion. Guys, I've had people come to me a lot with different passions that they've had. They feel like this is an injustice, that's an injustice. But actually, it has nothing to do with God and his kingdom at all. It's just something that they are ticked off about. You, you get me? And the difference is it needs to be something that ticks God off also. All right? So it's his burden and your burden together. And for Nehemiah, it was all about the city of Jerusalem and the disgrace that was falling upon God's people, the Israelites. And, and so he says he's sorry. I, if, if this is a burden that you want me to have, God, in these verses, then, I, then I'm ready to take it on. And he starts off, I think it's interesting, because he's mourned for several days before we get this recorded prayer that he did. And he, he, he says to God, and he says, God, you are great and you are awesome, and you are powerful. Do you know why it's important for you and I, when we sense that burden, when we sense this deal of injustice within our lives, to recognize God's greatness, his awesomeness, his powerfulness, and the fact that he sees everything? You know why that's important? Because it puts the problem in perspective. It's easy for us to become overwhelmed and thinking it's all on me. No, it's not all on you. God knows about it. He's got the power that you need to be able to solve that injustice. He's got the power that's needed for you to be able to change your world or the world that needs to be changed around you. So Nehemiah cries out to God, and he says, you are great and awesome. You remember David in the Old Testament? David goes out. His dad, this is when he was just a boy. It's what gained, gained his worldwide fame, or at least Israel's fame. And he goes out because his dad says, son, I want you to go out because your older brothers are all in the battle line against the Philistines. And so 
David goes out, he goes through the drive-thru at McDonald's, packs up a bunch of Big Macs. Oh, they weren't available then. Anyway, he packs food, and he goes out to visit his, his brothers on the battle line. As he draws near, he sees that the Israelites are camped on one side of, of this valley, this, and the Philistines are on the other side. And there's this big giant of a man by the name of Goliath. You remember him? Who remembers Goliath? And he's standing out in the middle of the, the, the uh, valley or the, there, and he's yelling and screaming at the Israelites, come out and face me like a man. We'll fight this day. Whoever wins gains the whole territory. You know, your God is a wimp. You know, and he just keeps calling out curses to God over and over again. David comes up and he hears that, and it's just, it's just incensed about him. You know, here he is, this guy's mocking God. He's saying God's weak, he's powerless, he's impotent, things of that nature. And no one would go out and fight this giant. The, the whole Israeli army is just sitting there, knees are knocking, and they're just scared to death. You know, he's, he's big, he's nine feet tall. And so David says to his brothers, you know, why aren't you doing something about that? Why are you letting him get away with that? I mean, he's mocking our God. And the brothers are well, like he's nine feet tall, that's the reason we're letting him get away with it, you know? And David goes, this is driving me crazy. And day after day, David hears this, and finally David says, that's all I can stand, I can stand no more. And he goes out and picks up a beanie flip or a slingshot, goes up with five stones and along this creek bank, and he puts them in his, in his slingshot, and he runs like a madman. David is just a teenager Goliath is nine feet tall. He plays center for Amazon High, you know? I mean, he's, he's a big guy. And so he runs towards him. He's doing this slingshot. And lo and behold, he says, God, you're in control of this pebble. And he goes and hits one place that, that the armor is not in Goliath, and he slays him. It, it, it's because David had this holy discontent. I, I can stand no more. Doot, doot. And his way he goes. Then Wilbur, William Wilberforce became a follower of Jesus. He was a member of English Parliament. And when he became a follower of Jesus, it changed the way he looked at the world. And he was broken by the way people in England treated others. William Wilberforce believed that every single person was created in the image of God and therefore worthy of profound respect and kindness. Slavery just became abhorrent to him, made him physically sick. What did he do about it? He prayed, he fasted, he mourned, he created a plan, and Wilberforce became the force that, that changed the laws in England and abolished slavery. After Wilberforce became a Christian, he had this Popeye moment in his life. Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, reached the boiling point of, about apartheid and, and racial injustice. Both of them had this moment of holy discontent, their Popeye moment. This is all I can stand and I can stand no more. And they led a revolution. Martin Luther King got killed for it, but he had to do it. That was his obedience. That was his burden from God. So let me ask you again, what breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? What does God want you to do with that burden? A few years ago, there's a woman in our congregation by the name of Pat Roberts. She was, uh, she had been a public school teacher here in Muskogee for several years. Uh, she grew, she re re retired. She grew increasingly concerned about the amount of students who were going home on weekends who were, didn't have much to eat. She knew that the school system had, you know, breakfast and sometimes lunches for kids, and, and sometimes after that, they didn't get another meal. And she knew the results of that kind of malnutrition in, in kids. You know, she knew from the lives of elementary children that poor nutrition can result in weaker immune systems, so they're sick more, um, lower IQ, shorter attention span. That's what every elementary school teacher needs, isn't it? Shorter attention span. And uh, lower academic achievement. And it broke her heart. And she had a Popeye moment. And so she spent time researching different ideas, and she came upon the idea of using the backpack method that we use today of putting food into backpacks and sending it home with students on the weekend. And she went to action. Pat approached me one day at church. You have to know Pat. She was kind of a tour de force in everything she did. And, and uh, we were in the old building at that time. And she walked up the stairs and she said, she sits down on my desk and she begins talking, tapping her finger at the same time she's talking on the edge of my desk. And she says, James, this is horrible is what's going on. It broke her heart. 
And she said, we've got to, we've got to find some way to feed these kids. And so we put together the backpack program. She challenged people in our congregation to begin giving their spare change. And those of you who were around at that time, remember, we bought backpacks and began going to food banks and getting food. And many of you are still to this day organizing food and putting it in backpacks every Tuesday morning. But that was Pat's breaking point. But Pat wanted every school in Muskogee to have a church in Muskogee sponsor a school. At that time, I was president of the Ministerial Alliance, and she said, I want to come talk to the Ministerial Alliance. And I thought, this is going to be fun. <laughs> it was. It's like a revival meeting, and she had an invitation at the end of it. And uh, she asked for churches to sign up, and she went from church to church to help them organize it. We still didn't have enough churches to cover schools. She asked me for a list of churches in town, and she began going church to church, knocking on their door, talking to them, asking if they would start a backpacker. And before long, every school in Muskogee was covered by that. I think you get the point I'm, I'm belaboring, all right? Often God uses whatever rouses up, whatever breaks our heart, and he harnesses that, that firestorm of frustration to energize us to get off the couch and into the ring to fight for something, something that should have been fixed a long time ago. So I'm going to ask you a third or fourth time, I don't know how many, what do you notice in the world where you live, here in Muskogee, your community, your work environment? When you travel, what do you see on TV that just breaks your heart? That when you see that, it just moves you and you say, I've got to do something about it. What is it for you? Friends, you were designed by God to do something. You were designed by God to live this way. There's something that God wants you to do to prepare you to do this. This is what, what some writers call the, the moment of holy discontent within your life. To be able to see a need and God moves within you to say, I've got to meet that. I, I, I can stand it no more. I've got to do something. Now, you were designed to live that way. Let, let me go back to Nehemiah. Let's use, over the summer, we're going to use Nehemiah to coach us on the steps to prepare to change your world. I think every one of you know an area in your life, in your own personal life, that needs to be changed. Some of you know some areas in the community, places that you work that need to be changed. Our challenge today and from Nehemiah is change your world. Find what breaks your heart and change your world. Connect with him on it. Just, just put yourself out there with God. Now, here's some coaching points, okay, from Nehemiah. The first thing he does, I think, is that he leans into his pain. When he, when he hears about the gates being pushed down and broken down and burned and the walls there, I mean, he mourns, he fasts, he just, he doesn't push away his pain. He leans into that discomfort. Sometimes when we feel that discomfort, we want to run away from it as fast as we can. Hey, how, how is that Avenger movie? You know, or what was the, the PGA tournament, all that? Those things are fun to talk about, but there's sometimes you got to let the pain in your heart Work its way in so you can find what God wants you to do about it. Lean into the pain, you know? And he leans into this discomfort that God is putting within the very heart of his being. And he doesn't cap his emotions. I mean, he says, when I heard this thing, I sat down and I wept. And for several days I mourned. He doesn't kind of quell that grief. Ecclesiastes tells us that there's a time to dance, and there is. There's a time to celebrate. And sometimes we don't celebrate well, but there's a time to celebrate. We need to do a little more dancing. Oh, did I say that in church? It's okay, dance. And there's also a time to mourn, okay? There's a time to mourn. There's a time to fast. Fasting is just a spiritual discipline that we don't practice very often anymore where you set aside food for a period of time and you dedicate that time to pray and seek God's face and direction in our lives. That's Nehemiah's first bit of coaching for us. When God breaks your heart about a human need, he gives you a stirring up in your soul, a holy discontent, sit down, lean into the pain, reflect on it. 
and see where God is leading you and whether that's the burden that God desires for you. The second coaching tip that Nehemiah would give is this. <laughs> Sounds like so often you're putting something off. You pray. I mean, you pray. Nehemiah prays a clear-minded, take-no-prisoners kind of prayer. We Israelites, we've acted wickedly. We've broken your laws. I'm so sorry, God. I know why Jerusalem's in ruins, God. I, I confess to you, it's because we've turned our backs on you. We've defied your laws. We've ruptured the covenant of love that you've graciously extended to us. This whole debacle is, is our fault, God. And these types of prayers define reality. They defend the reputation of God, of God. And then God goes to work in your soul and in your prayers to give you plans how you might be able to overcome that, that injustice. And so Nehemiah can, makes that confession and it allows him the freedom to say, God, if you want to use me, I'm available. My hand's up. I, I'm ready to go. And that's big. That's big. Now, let me, let me close very quickly. I, I, I wished I had taken more time to wordsmith this better, but sometimes I don't do that very well. I think there's three groups of us in this building, in this room this morning. First group is, is a group that you, you've not found your holy discontent. You've not found what breaks your heart. You've heard me talk about this morning, and you're sitting there going, that's fine. Can we, can we get going? I need to get the brunch on Father's Day. It doesn't really break your heart. Um, let me give it to you straight. You, you do not want to go to your grave without ever identifying your holy discontent. You really don't. Don't go from this day to your final day of just living for yourself, living comfortably, living predictably, fall on your knees, mourn, fast, pray. Look around and look what God opens your eyes to see, what breaks your heart. And whatever that is, whatever that is, then you ask God to reveal your holy discontent. That's the prayer for group one. Group two, you, you used to know your holy discontent. At one point, your heart got wrecked. You had your Popeye moment, and you drank your spinach, and you got to work on it for five, 10 years, 15 years. You walked hard on it, and then all of a sudden, something happened. The team changed. Someone said something nasty to you. Your feelings got hurt. And you crawl back up into the stands and you observe and you observe and you become critical of anybody else who has a holy discontent. And you stay in the stands and you make your comments but you never get out on the field and play. Once again, guys, I don't want to stand before my Savior who suffered hurts, abusive language as well as physical abuse and say to him, I quit because my feelings got hurt. Third group. You, you identified your holy discontent years ago. You got up off the couch. You've eaten your spinach. Every once in a while you eat some more spinach. Your forearms have grown big and you've got, you're ready to go and you've been in this ministry or what's a particular ministry or some action step that you've had for years. But lately you've been wavering. Can I remind you of something that God reminded me of this week? Galatians 6, 9. I don't have it on the screen, but it says this. <laughs> let, us, let us not become weary in well-doing. For at the proper time, you will receive a reward if you don't give up and quit. Isn't that a great verse? Don't become weary in well-doing. For at the proper time, sometime God's going to give you Here's your reward. You're going to see the injustice change. Things are going to change if you don't give up and you don't quit. Stay faithful. Those of you whose hands are bruised and cut up because of, of service, 
Those of you who get tired once in a while, you know, God understands that. I certainly understand it. But don't become weary in well-doing. Stay faithful to the end. One last question, all right? You go, that's good. What was Jesus wholly discontent? What was Jesus wholly discontent? I, I think if you read through the three biographies of Jesus, you'd have to say it's when he observed people like you, people like me, wandering around our sin and in our rebellion. People who are disconnected from the Father, not knowing how to, how to get connected with him anymore. So Jesus is in heaven, and if I can put it in this irreverent way, he had his Popeye moment. He looked down on earth and says, I can stand no more. And he put on flesh and, and divested himself of the powers of God and came to earth, fully human, fully God, and did something about it. He lived among us, went through every temptation that we go through, every single one, including the temptation to give up. And he went to the cross. He taught like no one ever taught before or since that tent, and sometimes people walked away from him. He was really a good teacher, but sometimes people didn't want to hear it. He loved like no one had ever loved before, and times people got mad at him. He healed like no one had ever healed before, and there are times that people hated him. And so they nailed him to a cross. But you know what? He didn't stay there. On the third day, he raised up and he says, if you put your faith, you put your trust in me, I'll change your life. I'll forgive your past. I'll forgive your sin. I'll lead you into the future. I'll stir up within you a holy discontent so you can do something important before you spend your eternity on the other side. Is that exciting? Gang, I, I beg of you, Live full on for the one who lived full on for you. And therein is the excitement and the challenge and the adventure of following Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, Father Nehemiah has so much to offer us. And I, I pray that you, through your Holy Spirit, you would reveal to us which one of those groups we're in, whether we've not identified it, our Father, we have identified it and left that holy discontent or we're weary. And I pray that your spirit would speak to us in this moment right now. And Father, I pray that you would break our hearts. Father, that you would, you would break our hearts to the point of mourning over the injustice and things that you desire to pardon with us to change our world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.